know they don't want us up there. I'm not quitting. I think we should go to Pearson. You know, tell him what's going on. Honey, he left you out of his office. I'm endlessly inspired and excited by real people, real places and real landscapes and real communities. And I try to involve them as much as I can in the actual making of the film. There's a, an urgency about these people in this life that um, is almost constant. You like a little Boy Scout love, don't you? They went there when I was 27, something I was never prepared that I would do. I'm at work going to a man's job. Come on, Earl. Before that, I was just doing waitress work, making crummy wages. So when the mine started hiring women, I wanted to make that big money. When I go to work, I go from being a mom to uh, being tough. You get a different attitude. It's tough for the company to argue that you're all lying. That's why you have to get the others. They were really unbelievably generous to share their stories with us. You could quit tomorrow. Go sell your face cream. I need my job. I need this job just as much as you. The first group of women were mostly single women with families. The second group of women, that's when the, the younger ones started coming. That was the big shock. All these young girls running around in there that changed things. This is our lives you're screwing with. The Lois Jensen case was incredibly important because it was the very first class action lawsuit on the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace. When this all started, it seemed like people up on the range thought that we were complaining about swearing, dirty jokes. That wasn't it at all. When men didn't want to work with us, it wasn't because we couldn't do the work, because we could. Their jobs, they felt, were threatened by women working there. And as times got tough, you know, layoffs and things like that, it, it just grew hot more hostile. What happened in this case, there was a culture that makes the workplace hostile to many, many women. An engineer, an electrical engineer, stalked me. I guess there's no other way to put it. Um, wrote me letters that were inappropriate um, uh, in, a, in a confrontation that became very uh, physical. And at that point, I knew he was out of control and something had to be done. The difficulty was getting others to to get on board and stay on board. It takes an enormous amount of courage just to speak up because you know that as soon as you stand up, it's gonna double whatever you were getting before. It's hard enough to go out there without having that extra. And I just remember thinking, I, I can't do it. I can't do that. I can't come to work and have somebody do that to me. We all just came to the conclusion, if we honestly couldn't say, that we never witnessed or experienced sexual harassment, leave. But if you couldn't say that, then you better stay. No one, I believe, wants to turn in an employer. It's a difficult decision, and you have to think not only of what the employer is doing, but also how the community is going to react, your coworkers, male and female, and their families, as well as your own family. For me, it was very hard because of the fact that I had five brothers and all my brothers had lots of friends. So when I started in the mines, my bro a lot of my brother's friends were there and they were good to me. So when I joined the lawsuit, I felt like, like I was betraying them because it made it seem like it was all the men in the mines and it wasn't. It was a handful. There were men who supported me. Uh, some who had wives who worked in other mines and they were having similar problems and um, and they would come by and say you know you're gonna have as many men mad at you now if you quit or if or if you go ahead and pursue it I filed my complaint in 1984 um, October 5th and we finally finished the process with a settlement um, December 28th 1998 I think it's important for people to see this and to get the message out that this does happen. And uh, Dwayne? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And action. Yeah, you should get that checked out. My mom's got arthritis and she never tapes her wrist up. Put a look in that first.
I play Josie Ames, who is a single mom of uh, two children. She's leaving her husband and trying to um, support her family on her own. She ends up taking a job at the mine because the pay is really good and it enables her to, to be a single mom and support her children without getting into another bad relationship. When you need something and it's plain as day right in front of you, I need food, I need shelter, I need clothing, and I need my kids to be safe, I think that creates a revolution. What these women did is nothing short of a revolution. The story, I think, is really an important story. It's kind of the, the little people against the the machine. In Hollywood, sometimes it's all about whether a movie makes a hundred million dollars. And for me, it's about whether a movie makes a difference. And this is a picture that I was thrilled to make because it is a movie that makes a difference. Now, Let go! Get out of the car! Go to the truck. You're a whore, just like everyone says. Yes. Hey, Josie, stop it now! Authenticity is really about what this picture is about. I mean, authentic is really what we've tried to be. I'm not a mother, and that was a, a big thing for me, having to play a single mom of two children and one being 13. They wanted authenticity on the way that we dressed, acted, what our locker rooms were like. We usually went to work with our street clothes on, looking normal. Then we went to work and took our good clothes off and put our dirty work clothes on. But at the end of the day, they would shower and they would put themselves back together. It was important for them to walk out of the mine themselves, not a miner. Just trying to see if she's got a full pack. All right, fun's <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to work, slacker, come on. I think in, if, if the movie, or the movie is going to show the good men as well as the not so good men, um, that would be accurate. There are several good men out there. The most brutal thing that happens to Josie happens not when she's physically attacked in the mine. Who attacked you? Bobby in the powder room just now. But when she steps towards the women for help and they can't help her, they won't help her. Can somebody drive me home, please? Just take my keys in my locker. That's where it got really interesting for me when I was considering whether to do this film. I got so crazy. I got so crazy there. Used to be two beds, big yep. and little, a little quick. Why? Uh, too little. <laughs> <laughs> I peck. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> I was dying to work with Nikki Caro. I think there's just a mutual respect. I find myself um, really craving anything she has to say. And, and, and I, f I feel that it's reciprocated, and, and that's always nice to feel that with your director. What I love about the, the arc of our scenes together is that, in fact, they are, though emotional and deeply connected to emotional truths in the story, they're not sentimental. Keep whining and moaning. Well, we're doing the exact thing they want us to do. Screw that. Nikki kept a, a physical distance between the two of us, and that was so crucial. It was so crucial, I think, in the telling that those two specific character stories, and specifically to the way people deal with each other in a place like northern Minnesota. We started in Minnesota, which was such a gift to be able to be there because we, we spent about a month there for a rehearsal process. The mining culture, the people, what they, what they did in their downtime. We just took tiny little pieces of the story and of these people and, and whatever we could get our hands on, anyone who wanted to talk to us or give us information or anywhere we could go or as much time as we possibly could spend in the mines, those were the things we did. Going in there, it is so masculine and so loud and powerful and gray. You know, there's no pinks, you know, no pinks and little pastels, no. So <laughs> we immediately get a sense of what you have to do to survive. Spending time in those steel-toed boots um, taught me a lot. How you doing? All right, stand back. Okay. <laughs> when we started crushing and we were like, yeah! And we saw how women could get a little bit harder because of it. What Nikki really appreciates is masculine energy that while it can be incredibly uh, scary and it, it does become scary, there's also something incredibly vital about it. The scene in the Union Hall is probably the best example of that. You know what a class action is, don't you? God damn it! It means it's all of them against all of us. It was dangerous in that room. There was something really happening. Get the fuck out of here. 
to have 300 guys come in and to be able to work with their real feelings. It was amazing. Allowing this crowd to kind of take over the scene is really what happened. And her patience to kind of do that and just kind of see what happens. You know what I mean? To be very specific and know what you want, but also be very, very willing to, to really get, you know, to be truthful. My first day I was there, I shot the union hall scene. That's, no, rules, rules say she gets to talk. Now, you can have the gavel next to any one of you, but right now she's got I'll it. That... My first thought was, oh, can, can we work into this? You know, is there another scene we can do? But I tell you, it was great because it made you understand the, the life. So I started the movie kind of understanding how they lived. That was, I think, in my entire career, uh, the most devastating thing I've ever encountered. I was waiting to act. It never happened. It was three days of just experiencing, and um, and I don't think I've ever really encountered that. I just want to go to work like everyone else, get paid end of the week, feed my kids, and not a woman in that back row don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, she has the character. She she did not need any coaching from me at all, and uh, she she knew the part. She knew what it it needed, the depth that she needed to go to. She's doing a great job with it. The first cut, she ran out. She was crying, and well, we ran out. We didn't mean to, but we just got out there, and we were crying, and then we apologized for doing that. She said no. We all stood there in a group hug, and that felt really good. She did a real good job. Turn up, please. We're rolling. rolling. There have been no incidents of abuse at Pierce. That is not true. His Ames. Who is Sammy's My father? son. It's got nothing to do with any of this. It's hard because when she starts doing parts, it brings back memories of things we went through and things we heard and... Everybody take your seats. Ms. Ames, Ms. Ames, return to the stand, please. Return to the stand, Miss Ames. Your Honor, move for recess, please. Josie, wait, no, slow can't. down. I gotta get home to Sammy. I always think that a really good movie is about two things. It's about what it's about, and it's about what it's really about. And this movie is about women going to work in the iron mines when the men didn't want them there. But what it's really about is a woman and her son and the secret that they share and the resolution and the revelation of that secret. I said to Michael, the writer, you know, I have to write her telling her son about that. She has to make it right with him. I knew you weren't his. You were mine. And in making it right with him, she makes it right for herself. You had nothing to do with that ugliness, you hear me? Nothing. I think that's the, the challenge of the movie, both from a, a filmmaking perspective and from an audience's perspective, is how do you make something so terrible okay? And how does it become more than okay, but become a source of strength? It's over, isn't it? When you take that step, when you stand up, when you force a company to own up to what they've done and to take responsibility, it's tremendously, tremendously empowering. After we settled in 1998, we all held our heads high. And uh, in fact, the ride home was, you know, look what we did, look what we were part of. And that was the other part of it. It was something bigger than us. We've got uh, new people now and the ones that we were, the higher ups that we were having problem with are gone. And the higher up that are still there are really trying. And I give them credit for that. We taught our boys this isn't right. You treat a lady like a lady. So hopefully so did a lot of other people. There've just been so many changes over the years, but, but we still have a ways to go. The best this film can do is start a conversation. Should somebody see the film, they may be more sensitive to that going on. They may even want to say something or do something about it. We have a responsibility to shine a light on the people that have changed us for the better. And I think this movie does that. This is just as much a movie for my 16-year-old son as it is for my 21-year-old daughter, because it's about standing up for what you believe in. When survival is at stake, I think people really, they do what they have to do to survive. They made my life easier by doing what they did. The chances that they took and the sacrifices they made 
I don't have to make those sacrifices because of them. We didn't think we helped so many as now we're finding out that we did. I always wanted closure with this and I, I believe this is helping. I'm hoping people will understand that the story is real, but it is fictionalized. It's the message in the story that's important, and they should learn from this and grow from it. I, I think people will be moved.